Hey everybody, Jay Young here from King Operating. If you will, go to kingoperating.com, our website, and learn more about the oil and gas business. Every Friday I do a newsletter and I do a video that will teach you something about the oil business. And if you want to know something about the oil business, send me a question and I'll go over those on our Friday newsletter. So kingoperating.com, learn more about our business and get involved. The Jay Young Show is a weekly podcast featuring insightful discussions with anyone from big business CEOs, celebrities, to military heroes. Each interview is a personal conversation about business, life, and anything in between. And now, your host, Jay Young. Hey, today we have one of my really good friends, Phil Romano. And I mean, what an inspiration to lots of different people. And we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about the how Phil became... Healthy and wealthy and wise. It's a he's a great guy and he's got a great business plan. He's got a great life plan. In his new book, Mad. What's Mad? Mad is uh, M A D. Make are you a, mad? Make a difference. I'm mad every day. <laughs> <laughs> trying to make people mad too, Jay. You trying know, to make people mad. Yeah, you know it's it's that's what I do and it's uh, make a difference, make a place a better place today than it was before I got here. So Mad is M A D. Mad make, make, make a difference, make, not. The mad entrepreneur. No, well, I'm, I'm mad. I make people mad. I make people mad by being an entrepreneur. I do things that they need, something they 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 make their life easier, make it more pleasant, give them the things that they got to have to get through life. Mm, great, great. You know, a big part of your well-being is your family. You're a real huge family man. I mean, starting from your dad, your mom. What what did you learn the most from, say, your mom and your dad? Well. You know, that's where you get your your value system. You know, and, and I brought up Italian, so that's got something to do with it. And um, Sicilian? Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you got my sto- my joke. Right? I know. I, I'm my sorry. mother my, my, right, <laughs> my mother I'm said sorry. I'm not Italian. I'm, I'm Sicilian. <laughs> we twelve yeah, pounds just, twelve pounds when I was born. So twelve pounds and you were born, your mom's a little ninety six pounds. So. <laughs> yeah. so okay. Anyway, I'm sorry. She, um, um, so, you know, we're brought up in, in my first generation Italian. You know, my mother and father both from Italy. Mm. And they had, uh, they had a value system and, uh, you know, hard work and honesty and, and going forward. And they'd, they'd show me things and teach me things and uh, not really teach me, but they'd, they'd show me things. I mean, I used to work with my father. This was before Little League. And the Little League came, I quit my father and went to play Little League. Mm. But... You know, I'd go with him, and he was in the contracting business, you know, electrician. He'd build homes, too, and I'd go with him, and sometimes he'd say, look at that guy over there. He says, he's leaning against the wall. He can't stand on his own two feet. Mm. You know, things like that, and yeah. we're going we're gonna to have coffee with the guys, and that guy's never going to put his hand in the pocket to pay anything. He's got fish hooks in his pocket. You know? wow. But he'd tell me, teach me things like that, examples, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they stuck with me all through life. And, you know, and, and my mother, my father used to say to me, he says, you know, I don't care what you do or what you become. To be the very best at it. I don't care if you become a bum. Mm. Be the world's most famous bum. You know? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and then, then, then my mother used to say, you know, that you think, you think of the devil, the devil will appear. Mm. Think about good, and good will happen. Mm. So you know, these are things that they you know, and, and bred in me. Yeah. As, as we go along, and and, um, and you also put that in your book. You got a little self plan in your book for people to come in and. And, and read, and this has all the things that have to do with your with your growing up. Yeah, well, that's true. You know, I have a son. I had him when I was um, 55 years old, and I had a son. And um, the greatest things that ever happened to me. Sam. And, yeah, his name is Sam. Yep. And I, I hate to say it, but I brought him up like a business. Mm. Uh, with love and nurture, and you're supposed to love and nurture your business, too. Mm-hmm. So I, I brought him up like this, and I used to drive him to school every day, Jay. That was my, that was my job. We drive the school. It took us maybe 10, 15 minutes to get there, depending mm-hmm. on the traffic. But I said, oh, here's my chance to, to gain, take him and, and maybe brainwash him. You know, make a difference. Make a difference in his life. There you I, go. And I, that's what I said to him. I said, Sam, there's, there's five things you got to have in your life in order to make a difference. Okay? And, and, and I tell him, and this is even preschool we started. And I tell him, Sam, I said, uh, the first thing you got to have is, is you got to have principles. We talk about it. We say principles are sticking to your deal, doing what you said you're going to do. That's principles. The next one was responsibility. You got to be responsible. 
responsible for the choices you make, and responsible for the consequences if they're not the right choices. Mm. And number three, you got to have integrity. You know, you got to be honest, truthful, you don't lie, and you don't lie to yourself. Mm. And the fourth one was communication. You got to communicate. You got to communicate your message. You got to communicate what you think. Don't let other people tell you what to think or how to think. Express yourself. And number five has three things in it love of God, patriotism, your country, and charity, giving back. I said, I trust you. You're my, you're my son. I'm, you know, I'm close to you. And I've got, you know, I've got a, I, I want you to pick the right kind of people to hang around with. Now, if you have this value system, you're going to pick people just like that. Mm-hmm. They're close to it. And they're going to pick you as a friend, too. Now you've got camaraderie. It's like playing on a football team and every, the goal is to make touchdowns, okay? But you're all together. Mm. Okay, it's right. a unit. And this is what you're going to go through life with. You're going, you're going life, through life with a, with a peer group. And these are the friends that you're going to keep the rest of your life, the good ones, which he has. He's done very well. And, you know, I've, I've, I took it a step further. <laughs> I made, I made a, well, you are the achiever. We'll yeah, talk about that in just a minute. Yeah, I made but, uh, a, I made a, overachiever. I made an org, org charts for him. Mm. They need, they need a, a pathway and a guide, you know, a guide to get through life. So I said, okay, I put the org chart in the very top, you know, the, I put health. Health is the most important. This will get you through college, through, through life, and there's your health. So you've got to take care of your health. You know, you know drugs a lot, you know, do, do drinking, you know, you, don't, you, don't, you, you keep your body healthy. Okay, keep a healthy body, a healthy, healthy mind. The next thing you got, you come way over to the left is your parents. So what do you expect from your parents? Parents got to teach you to be independent, functional, be able to get along in life and get the things you need to have. And they'll provide the things you need to have to be successful. Mm. The next one, on the block on the, on the chart, is um, your uh, academia. Academia is going to teach you, mm. give you the tools to be successful. You know, keep getting you in college, you know, get, you understand your uh, the, the read, write, arithmetic, and all that kind of stuff. And that's mm. going to teach you, you know, how to function too. The next one is your girlfriend or your boyfriend if you're a girl. And that's, that's going to teach you camaraderie, how to get along with the opposite sex, teach you love, companionship, you know, and how to treat a woman, all that kind of stuff. You know, you're going to learn that. Okay, the next thing, you're going to learn about love too. The next thing is athletics. What's that going to do for you? Well, that's going to keep you healthy. It's going to maybe get you in college if you get a scholarship. It's going to get you get you to, you know, teamwork, teach you how to work hard, be a winner, give you prestige, mm. do all these things for you, give self confidence in yourself. The next one, way over your friends. Okay, what do your friends give you? Camaraderie, company. They're going to be your your companions going through life. Mm. You're going to go. You're going to probably be in business with some of them. You're going to go and and be um, you know. Going to ball games with them, you know, raise your kids together, all this kind of stuff you're going to have. Mm. So they're they're an important factor too. Okay, so that that's your org chart. That's where you're going. When you get out of college, that changes. Your parents aren't so important to you anymore. You still got to have your health, but your parents aren't aren't important to you anymore because you're you're functional. You're going. You're at it. Mm-hmm. Academia is your career. That's your job. That's what you're going to be doing the rest of your life. Your your girlfriend, or boyfriend. That's going to be your family unit. Your wife, your kids, that's what you're going to go through life with. Mm. Okay, and help them the way I, I've helped you. Right. The next is, next is um, uh, athletics. Well, that's going to keep you healthy, whether you're running, swimming, jogging, whatever you're doing. Mm. Playing tennis, that's what you got to do to keep healthy. You got to keep your health. Without your health, you can't have anything. Then the last one, your friends, again, that's your world. You're going to go to, you're going to be in business with them. You're going to go to the ball games with your kids, raise your kids together, go to, you know, you're going to go to their funerals, their weddings. You're going to be part of their life. They're going to be part of your life. Mm. Make new friends. That's right. your life. Because everything else is, you know, your, your old things that you grew up with probably be gone, separated. But you got to you create new people, new friends all the time. Mm. But that's your life. Well, And you still got the value system on the bottom. But it's in the book. Right. It's that's a great book. part of the book. That's a great yeah, part of the yeah, book. That's good. I think a lot of great stories in the book. Good, and thing, good, thing, good, good thing I did it now before I forget. <laughs> What a great guy. I mean, you know, if you think about what's Phil Romano most known for, and I just think of him as a friend and somebody that we laughed with and 
tell jokes back and forth. And, and you know, if you think about it for a second, you know, I was thinking about this yesterday. I was going to L.A. and back in one day, and I thought, well, hey, what, what's a question I could ask Phil? Or what, what's the biggest thing that people would want to know about Phil? Because started restaurant concepts in 1965, over 30 different restaurant concepts. You know, but the biggest one, I think, there's 7 billion, 7 billion people on this planet, 7.7 billion people on this planet, and I'm not sure how many have ever started one national successful restaurant chain, or how many of those have started two, or three, or four, I mean, is it five, or is it six? Six different nationally successful restaurant chains. That's that's amazing. I mean, it really just, I mean, so you started off with Fuddruckers, you know? Yeah, Fuddruckers, Fuddruckers was the... Just thought... It was the first one that, uh, in fact, brought Fuddruckers public, first public company I had. Right. And then um, the um, next one was uh, Macaroni Grill. Macaroni Grill. And Cozy Mel's. Rudy's Country Storm Barbecue. Nano, Nano, what, what was Cozy Mel? Nano Mama's? Nacho, Nano, whatever that name. Nacho, Nacho, Nacho Mama's. Nacho Mama's. <laughs> when, when I sold, when I sold, uh, when I sold uh, Nacho Mama's to Brinker, you know, and they, they said, oh, that's not politically correct. We can't use that. So we changed it to Cozy Mel's. Cozy Mel's. <laughs> <laughs> Where did Cozy Mel's come from? I always thought about Cozumel, Mexico. Yeah, well, you know, that's a, Where, they, they is just, that kind of the. I got a story that goes with that a couple of. Mexicans, they had a grocery store down in Mexico, you know, and they, Monterey, and they wanted to come to America, you know, so they started, started to come up here, and they couldn't spell Cozumel's right. You know, so, <laughs> so, so, so Cozumel, so Cozy Mel's, you know. And they, Cozy Mel's, there you go. And, it, uh, and they <laughs> made a little grocery store out of it, you know, and it worked out fine for them. That's great. That's great. What a, what a great deal. So we talked about Sam for a minute. You dedicate the book. This is the right way to look at the book. You dedicate the book to Sam. Right, right. Hey, this is this book is for Sam, and, and uh, he did play collegiate sports, lacrosse. Yeah, he played lacrosse at Syracuse University. Wow. Let me, let me tell you a story about him. You know, he's got, what, what, I'm, you know, you say, I, I may have some fame if you want to call it that, but the, the person I'm dependent on making me famous is my son. Mm. Okay, <laughs> he's, I, I want him to be the guy that, that takes the torch and goes and makes a difference and uh, makes his mark in the world, you know, is uh, much greater than I have if I made a mark. And I think you made a little bit of a mark. Okay, well, uh, not sure, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, I, I, you know, when he was in a in the sixth grade, went to ESD, in the sixth grade, and the teacher made him write a letter. Okay, I'll write a letter to himself. In the letter, she asked him some questions about his friends and what he wants to do when he gets out of college, and where what he wants to do when he gets out of high school. What are you going to do? Okay, so he wrote the book, he wrote all that up, and and then. Uh, when he graduated from high school, she mailed it to him, and we read it together. Wow. And it said, it said that one of the questions he had on it was, or she had on it, was, was what do you want to do when you get out of high school? And he says, when he's in the sixth grade, he says, I want to go to Syracuse University, and I want to play <laughs> lacrosse. In the sixth wow. grade, you talk about, you know, goal-oriented, and, and mission going. So he figured out what he had to do to get there, and what he better not do if he didn't want to get there. Mm. You know, so so <laughs> yeah. he figured it out. You know, yeah. He did it. And he did his, I mean, he, he self-promoted himself on his, you know, I, I, uh, on, a, on the TV, I mean, on his, uh, uh, all the blogs he did on all that stuff, you know. And hey, he had one blog, he, he, got, he got over maybe total of over half a million hits on it, you know, wow. for the whole, in the whole wow. career. But he, he did all that, and he got there. He got the Syracuse University, youngest person, youngest kid they ever recruited. He was number one in the state of the state of Texas, mm. number three in the country as a recruiter. Wow. He recruited. Wow. So he did, he did very well, but he, he did it himself. He was determined. He had a goal, and he worked toward that goal. He, he got did. his grades, kept, kept his nose clean, got his grades, worked hard, and got it. Mm. You know, so I'm very proud of him. You know, and, and yeah. That's the kind of determination you need. Even in business today, you need that kind of determination. He's got that. He's got that seed. Right. And it's like anything. My father passed down a lot of things to me, and I want to pass down a lot of things to my son. Right. That's important right. to me. Yeah, I know it is. I know. It, I know it's important to you. That's great. And now, and now, Sam works at Nick's and Sam's. Yeah, Nick and Sam's. Oh, he, good. Uh, yeah, he's he's there. You know, he's uh, he's got uh, he owns the majority of Nick and Sam's. Does he? Yeah. That's and, great. And, and I've uh, put him there, and I said, Sam. I is this the one down in downtown? On Oakland. Yes. In okay. Oakland, Nick okay. And Sam's uh, uh, Steakhouse. 
And he's there and I said, hey, here, you, you learn about this and you learn about what makes it successful and what's going to hurt it if it's not being done right and all that stuff, and you're there to keep it, keep it good. Right, keep right. Keep it holy. This is your, your livelihood. So you learn it and you become part of it and, and go from there. You got, uh, you got a lot of help. You got myself, you got uh, Joel, and you got Samir, and you got, uh, you got uh, Miriam, the bookkeeper, you know? It's like a big family down there anyway. Now, I'm, mm-hmm. you know, now they had a kid. <laughs> That's Sam. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because, you know, I, I put this together and I got, had Joe as my, um, you know, Joe's like a son to me too. You know, and Samir, Samir, same thing, you know. Mm-hmm. We started off together from the, you know, we started it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I get people pieces of my business when I start doing it. And I got to make them part of it. Mm. Okay. That's when they're going to worry about it. That's when they're going to take care of it. And that's when they're going to make it me more successful than I, I have in it. And I, that's what I did with Joe and with Samir and with Miriam. And so they, they got it to where it is today. Wow. You know? Wow. And now we're going to bring Sam in the fold and, and get Sam to be involved with them, you know, yeah. and go with that stuff and get with it and, and everything else. And uh, so, it, uh, you know, it's, it's like uh, I brought Joe in to bring in a, a different crowd. I got the older people. <laughs> They're all gone now, Jay. <laughs> they don't like the noise, like, the, you know, the younger people now. They don't like all the noise. There's millennials and everybody else happening there. Right. But anyway, so Joe brought in a separate, different crowd then I was bringing in. Mm-hmm. My crowd was dissipating. His crowd was growing. Mm. That was the era he was in, so he's bringing them in. Right. And now his is starting to dissipate, and Sam's is these millennials going in there. He's got another, there's a whole other group of people, mm. and that's going to be his audience, wow. his customers, and all that stuff going forward. Wow. So someday, you know, uh, I mean, someday he's going to be running the whole place, and, and Joe's going to be like me, stood up by his side and just, you know, getting, getting his, his interest payments or his payments and all this stuff like I do, you know, and, and this, they, he does all the work. That's great. And he makes the bulk of it, but he goes with it. That's great how you give back or you give ownership. I know you said something about raising $150,000 for, was that Macaroni Grill? No, no, that was Fuddruckers. That, that was Fuddruckers, okay. Fuddruckers. You couldn't find anybody to finance you, and you said, hey, I need one hundred fifty grand." Yeah, and you That's g- a funny story. Yeah. I went I went to my banker, and I was in, I was in, came from Florida, and I was in Texas for about maybe – Oh, a year, two years, you know, and I saw a need for good hamburgers, you know. And mm-hmm. a, there was a, a, a you know, the, every time you start a business, it's got to have a reason for being started. It has to serve a purpose and solve a problem. Mm. And that's when a good entrepreneur is an opportunist. He looks for an opportunity, an opportunity to, to solve a problem that people are coping with. Right. You know, or it's, it's happening, and you got to recognize these things. Okay, to recognize and be part of the marketplace, understand what's happening all around you. So, Fuddruckers. I remember the Quarter Pounder. Remember at uh, McDonald's. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was a that was a great hamburger. Mm-hmm. I, I had that in college and everything else. When I got out of college working, I still went there to get that hamburger. It was good. They kept it the same, but what wasn't the same was the price. Mm. They made a big sin. I think, and that's charging three times as much for the product and not changing it, not making it any better. Mm. I said, wow, they got a kink in their armor. Mm. I'm going after that. Mm. I'm going to create a better hamburger, bigger hamburger, charge more for it, get the clowns out of the way, put the long neck beers in there, you know, and, and, and the, the things that I think are great, keep it to a hamburger, create a hamburger, create the world's greatest hamburger. Right, right. And, and do that. That's my. That was my purpose. That was the... My, my goal, okay? And that, that's why it worked. And if you told people it was a quarter pounder, you really gave them a little bit more oh, I, I than, than a quarter with, pounder just so they'd think, wow, this is... I started out with eight ounces, and I made it nine ounces, didn't tell anybody. <laughs> okay? so, that's awesome. What yeah. a great concept. But anyway, it, it's funny. There's some funny stories about that, too, is that we, um, you know, I, I, today I, I, I always say that if I didn't do the things that people told me not to do, I wouldn't be where I am today. <laughs> you know, I said, well, okay, I said... I'm going to make the world's greatest hamburger. How do you do that? Mm-hmm. Well, I said, you know, I've been in the business, you know, in the restaurant business for a while. And I said, you know, you buy a hamburger, you buy it by a bucket. Mm-hmm. It's a bucket of um, um, ground up beef, okay? You get it, and you don't know what is in it, what's in it. You don't know how long it's been there, if it's been frozen or what it is, you know, until you open it up and eat it. And all the blood goes to the bottom of it, you know, and all this stuff. And it's not, not you know, and I said, I've i got to protect my customers. I want to make sure that this meat is good. Mm. I'm going to get my whole four quarters, and I'm going to grind them myself. 
in front of them behind a glass. Mm. And I'm going to ground up the hamburger right there, too, so they could see it. <laughs> you know, they said, oh, you can't do that. I said, well, I'm going to. You know? <laughs> and I'll meet people nice. So I did that. And oddly enough, hamburger at the time was about a buck sixty-five a pound. I was getting my hamburger to the customer. That hamburger patty was costing me about 36 cents a pound. Wow. Okay, wow. doing it that way. Mm -hmm. That's why they didn't want me to do it. <laughs> so anyway, so anyway I, it, it worked out fine because I took the, you know, I, mechanically I took the, I, I took the ribeye out, you know, and I cut ribeye sandwiches and sold those for six or seven dollars, and I put that cost against my hamburger. So you know, because I was not in the ribeye business, I was in the hamburger business, so right, the cost right. down for my hamburgers. And uh, so it just it just worked out fine. So that was the number one thing. I said my hamburgers got to be done right, my own meat. I know it. I know it's fresh. I see it's fresh, and that's the deal with Fuddruckers, and that's the deal today with the restaurant business. Real food to me is fresh food. Mm. Now, you can't just tell people today it's fresh. You got to show them. They don't believe anymore. They got all fake news and this and that bullshit going on. Mm -hmm. You don't. You got to tell them. Mm. You show them. You got to tell them, but you got to show them. Right, right. So this and that. You come in the Fuddruckers, and there's the, there's the four quarter of beef hanging there, right? Mm -hmm. Fifteen minutes, you're going to be eating that. Mm. Now that's fresh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I said, how do you cook your bean? Number one, how do you cook it? Well, I'm going to cook mine to the right temperature that the people want. To do that, you got to do it on the black iron griddle. Mm. Now, you put it out there, and you can treat it medium, rare, however you want it. Mm -hmm. and, and it retain, remains its, its juices because you don't press it down. You leave it on the grill, flip it, get the right temperature you want on it, and go from there. So it's got to be cooked in, cooked in front of them. They see it. They get it to the temperature they want. Mm. The same thing. We did it next one with the buns. We did our buns in a bakery. We baked our own buns. They said, oh, you can't do that. They said, good. I did the buns. Mm. And we did them across the room. So you're coming across with the hot buns, tray the hot buns, and you know, when everybody's in there, go down there and you slice them with a, with a asbestos glove. That they're still hot. Mm. Put them on the, on the grill with the butter, you know, and get them all, you know, grilled oh, up. Yeah. Then you got that hamburger you cooked, okay? And, and you put it out there. So the other thing was what you put on your hamburger. It's your burger. You can put what you want to put on it. Yeah. Not let the chef decide. Put right. a bunch of lettuce and tomatoes, however you want on it. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing was important was, you want cheese? Yeah, we got melted cheese. So we don't have to overcook your hamburger to melt the cheese. <laughs> so, it, you know, so that worked out fine. Yeah. So, you know, so the whole thing coordinated. And, and the other thing was important was what the place looked like. Okay. Now, the, what the place looked like was I wanted to make like, look like I'm putting you right smack in the middle of seeing the world's greatest hamburger being made. Mm. Come in, you see the, you see the um, chefs. No, you see the meat being. The meat, the cut, chefs, and chefs, everybody cooked, right there. Buns being done, all the produce out there. You see, it, and you're part of it. You know, you're part of it. They also yell every once in a while. Fresh buns coming. Yeah, coming hot, through? Hot, hot buns. Hot, hot buns. buns. Hot, hot buns, buns coming through. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we had t-shirts made up. Funny t-shirts. You know, yeah. That's all. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So I think one of the other deals that people told you. Hey Phil, this ain't gonna work. This ain't gonna work. Don't do it. Don't do it. Was the was the wine on the uh, oh, uh, 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 macaroni uh, grill? Macaroni. It's funny, you know. I did them. Um, I bought this little this this little town of uh, of uh, Leon Springs out there in, in San Antonio, about 15 miles out of San Antonio. I lived in a dominium on a big hill, you know, and I was oh, kind of quasi retired, you know. And you had some success with Fuddruckers. Yeah, yeah. This is after Fuddruckers. Yeah, I had. I, I was kind of playing golf and yeah, yeah. I had I had more money than I could spend, but not more money than I could lose. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, good point. Yeah, <laughs> I was. Well, it was harder to spend in Leon Springs <laughs> than it is in like New York yeah, City. Well, I know, I know, but I, I wanted something to do, you know. So I, thought, yeah. um, I wonder if I put a, a a neat restaurant out there in the middle of nowhere, if people come to it. So I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna try it just so I got something to do, you know. So I went down and I bought the little town and there was a, it used to be a you know, um, military base there or something and a long, long time ago. So and this used to be a, a dance hall that they had for, for the troops. So I got that and I converted it to a restaurant. So what kind of restaurant? Well, I was hearing so much about this new, new Italian restaurant that's out there called Olive Garden. Olive Garden, yeah. So I went to it, you know, and I'm Italian. To me, that wasn't Italian food. <laughs> I hate to say, you know. Norman got mad at me because I said that because he's a friend of uh, uh, the guy that owned it. But I said, hey, I said, uh, this is if, if, if this guy could do it with what he's cooking, what he's doing, it's like a, a corporation trying to make Italian food. 
Mm. Give me Italian food by Italians. Mm. You know, and the whole thing. So I said, heck, if he could do it, I could do it. So I said, I'm gonna, this place is going to be Italian. I'm going to make it like, like, like I was when I brought up, okay? Is this the, the food or the experience everything. or the atmosphere everything or just gotta, the whole every, thing? Everything. Everything's got to be part of it. Yeah. It's got to be the whole concept. So you're okay? walking into Olive Garden, sit down eating, and your brain's just... Yep. Okay, done. I got out of there, went down. I said, okay, it's Italian restaurant. Start, start putting it together. And I said, you know, I didn't have a... We never had a dining room when we were growing up as a family. Mm. We ate in the kitchen. And we cooked on the stove. We ate in the kitchen. We had the table there. My grandfather mm-hmm. made the, cause my, my, my father was in the, in the military. He went, went in the service when Pearl Harbor hit. They all volunteered. He went there. He was in, in Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. And, um, and two days after it happened. So here we are. We, um, I'm there. My grandfather's raising me and all, and my mother and all that. And so he'd be making the wines down in the cellar. Mm. Wow. Okay. We'd come in, had the dining room, the kitchen table, that's where we'd be eating in the, in the kitchen. We'd eat that. But my mother would always put, you know, tablecloths on the table, you know, and flowers from the garden in the back. And my grandfather would take his wine from down there, a big jug of wine, set it on the table. Didn't have wine glass, had tumblers, you know? Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, wine glasses <laughs> yeah. break too easily. You know, that's, not, that's, <laughs> yeah. not, that's for the French people, not the Italian. <laughs> so, so we, uh, and, and we'd, uh, and, and we ate. So I said, when I did, macaroni grill I said I'm gonna do it the same way I'm gonna have people walking into the kitchen so they see it so it's kitchen on one side your kitchen on the other side of you have to split the kitchen so you're walking through the middle then you're looking down at the dining room okay and in the dining room we had I bring people on a, on a ride going up and going down they look up and they had all the light bulbs mm. they walk in well what kind of place is this you know and they see food on both sides in the middle of the kitchen they're looking around you know and then and then you look down that kind of bring them, bring them down a little bit. Mm-hmm. They look on the tablecloths, you know, with tablecloths on, on the tables, you know, and paper on the top of the tablecloths. Well, we bring them back up again, you know. <laughs> then they look at the concrete floors, you know, the brick walls and all that, and bring them down again. Mm. And then we had the flowers, the gladiolas, all the way down the middle on that aisle going down there. Oh, yeah. We had those on there, and that was just, you know, sort of bring them up. So I put them on a ride. Then the food was just, I mean, food that my parents had, they did, the way you had it, real Italian food. Oh, yeah. Asiago uh, cream sauce was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, it was incredible. Uh, so and we, the tiramisu, but we won't go into all the different yeah, dishes. Oh, yeah. but. But, but it was good. It worked out, worked out fine. It's, I'll tell you a story. This is a funny story. You know, when I started the Fuddruckers, you know, we were open for about maybe six months, and Norman Brinker came in. I never met Norman. Norman never met me. He came in and he um, he came in with about five or six people, you know, and I wasn't there. He came into the, the counter, you know, and he, he told all his friends that, that I talked to some of them afterward that came in with him. He said, now, this is in a hamburger business. This is the way to be in a hamburger business. And he just bought chilies. Mm. So he came up to the girl on the counter and he said, here, I'm Norman Brinker. Gave her his card. Would you have Philip give me a call? I never met him. He never met me. Well, the girl happened to be my sister. Mm-hmm. And it happened to be in a quiet time. We're going to go public. Mm. And my underwriter, the first time, I was very naive, and he said, don't talk to anybody. So I told my sister, I don't want to talk to anybody. Just make excuses. I don't want to go there. So she grabs the camera. Well, she says, you know, he's not going to return your call. He doesn't return calls. In fact, that he's, he's in Italy having a good time. <laughs> so, so, so Norman grabs his card, puts it back in his pocket. And I never, I never heard from him, you know. Nor, so I just let it go. But I heard he was there, you know, people told me. So... Ten years later, when I did macaroni grill, same thing was happening. People were coming in. I couldn't. I don't know. I didn't want to do another public company. I didn't want all that. So who bought Fuddruckers? Oh, we were public. The public company. So in public. Okay. Public. Okay. So we. Um, I did. I, I, I got. So Norman came to Norman fud, came to came uh, in, macaroni no, grill. No, I called Norman up. I called him up because I didn't want to. I want to start another. I didn't want to start another business. I wanted to give my my concept to somebody that's already had the wheel invented, put it in their system, and grow it. Right, right. So I called Norman up. I said, Norman, I said, this is Phil Romano, and I'm returning your call. <laughs> and he said, ah, damn, that was 20 years, 10 years ago. I said, <laughs> yeah, why well, didn't I want to call you until I had something good to show you? There you go. So he said, okay. He says, uh, tell him about it. He said, well, okay, I'm, I'm ready to make a trip with my, with my staff to all our operations and I'm flying. So he 
He said, I'll, I'll send Lane Cardwell down there, uh, VP, senior VP of strategic development, and he'll tell you what, they could do, what you could do with it. Mm. Go, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> next day I get a call from Lane. He comes and says he's coming down. I came down. But then he liked what he saw. He said, you're going to hear from Norman real soon. So next day I get a call from Norman. Norman says, hey, he says, I'm going to come down with my people, uh, take a look at your place. Lane can't get over it. He says, really impressed with it. I said, okay. So he came down that night with about six of his people, and they sat down there. Eating. And Norman and I were walking around, and we go in a corner. He was there for 20 minutes. We're standing in the corner. He looks around. He says, okay, how can we do the deal? <laughs> Just like that. And I said, well, Norman, I said, I'll, wow. I'll tell you what. Wow. I'll tell you what. I said, you're a public company. You know, in Chile's, then you're a public company, and, and you got a PE. I says, I, I'm just, I'm not getting earnings. I tell you what, you give me my projected earnings against your PE, and you know, because then you could do that because you didn't have, you could evaluate uh, goodwill. Mm. So I said, okay, and all you're giving me now is paper. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're giving me paper. You give me your stock, and your stock will sell for so much, and take my earnings, and my earnings will sell for so much more. Your multiple and your PE. Oh, okay. He said, I like that. I like that. So 26 days after we, we shook hands there, and 26 days after we closed the deal. Oh, my God. And it's funny. I got, I think I got over, a little bit over $5 million worth of their stock. Mm. Wow. Okay. And the stock was $15 a share. Well, I took that, and then Norman says, Philip, I want you to come work for the company. I said, Norman, I said, I never had a job. Not since I got out of college. I never, never had a job. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm. I'm I'm very, I, I can't work, I can't hold a job. I'm, I'm, I'm unfit to have a job. What do you mean? I said, well, I, you know, I, I just don't take, don't take orders. I don't want anybody telling me what to do and making decisions on my livelihood. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I'm not in control of it, man, I don't want anybody else in control of it and I'm, I'm busting my ass on it. No, mm -hmm. can't do it. Said, well, we want you to take, you know, make sure it goes the way it's supposed to go. So we decided he's gonna, I was gonna be a consultant. So he's going to pay me X amount of dollars a year, which is very substantial back then. I think it was 500000 or something? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Wow. So I said, okay. He really wanted yeah. you. Yeah, it's okay. And that's for about 50% of my time. And that's another one condition that you could let me go in 30 days. And I could leave in 30 days because you're wasting my money, my time. You know, and I own stock in the company now. So it's <laughs> a right. bad deal either way for me. So you can let right. me go or I can let you go. So okay, okay, that's the way it was. It's so, hard to walk away from that, that good salary back then. Yeah, no, it's but, good. Well, yeah. but I was making. I had, you know, I, I, yeah, I had, you already had a little money. I just sold out, sold out of uh, Fuddruckers, and I had, you know, I had, I was money. You know, money doesn't become a motivator after a while. It's a, it's applause. Right. You know, yeah, right. this something good. You know, type of right. thing. It's good. So, I said, Norman, okay. So we I came on board, and I sold that stock, five thousand dollars, five million dollars worth of stock, right. Fifteen dollars a share. I sold it one hundred and twenty-five dollars a share. Oh my gosh! Wow. One, one restaurant. Wow. One concept. Yeah. Wow. But that's it. Give it to somebody else and go. See. What, what a good entrepreneur does. A good entrepreneur does. You, you, you start a business. Okay. You get it going. You nail it. You get it canned. A lot of people the mistakes they make. They say, "Hey, I created this. I'm going to bring it to the moon." Mm. Well, know what you know and know what you don't know. Right. Okay. Right. I take my concepts and I sell them to somebody that knows how to grow it. Mm -hmm. I'd have to learn how to grow it. Right. So I just start to somebody that knows how to grow it already, and let they grow it, and they grow it. And I, right. You know, I'm, I get a lot of money for it. Mm -hmm. I make I make money, and I'm, you know, CEOs and, and COOs come and go, but founders are only one 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 founder. Right. And that's me. So I'm always be the founder of it. Right. I get the credit for it. And if it goes to the moon, I get the credit. It's my concept, and I make a lot of money. Man. If it goes this way. I didn't do it, they did it. Right. <laughs> so it's a win-win <laughs> deal for me. <laughs>